and not providing as much of a quote unquote rest state. Now, what is the purpose of sleep? Normally, in the average individual, when they go to sleep, their heart rate slows down, their blood pressure goes down. A lot of the inflammatory molecules that your body is making throughout the day while you're dealing with stress, whether it's um, for this population, it would be crying grandkids. For me, it's crying child. Um, <laughs> it's interacting with other individuals on a day-to-day -day basis at work, in your social situation. All of these things can cause transient surges of stress, which increase inflammatory molecules in our body. That's relevant from a heart standpoint, because in the end, all disease processes, whether it's the heart or otherwise, are stemmed by inflammation. It's inflammation that's triggering a disease process. So you go beyond a certain trigger, um, stress, sorry, so go beyond a certain threshold, inflammation can lead to a disease process. And I think all of you know this because if you're really tired and exhausted and dealing with a lot, you're more likely to get sick. All right, so it's a very simple, practical thought process. All right, um, the only point I want to make here is if you think about falling asleep, you're probably not going to fall asleep. And it's really complicated, but it's not something we're supposed to think about. All right? So if you look at this, there are about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different centers involved in helping the brain shift from sleep, from wake to sleep. All right? If you think about what's going on, it's not going to happen. This is a natural process. This is the why, why we think about it as being downtime or down regulation. Your mind should not be active. Now, I'm going to kind of tackle this from the standpoint of how do sleep disorders correlate or, or how are they associated with heart disease. Um, the most common two presentations are either I'm sleepy all the time, and I'll tell you, I have a lot of patients who tell me, I'm not sleepy, but I can sleep anywhere, anytime. You're sleepy. Okay? I have a lot of men tell me this, particularly. I'm not sleepy. And then their wife is sitting there telling me they fall asleep at the drop of a hat. They fall asleep while they're talking to me. That's a problem. Okay. Now, the other one is insomnia, where you can't fall asleep or you cannot stay asleep. It's very disrupted. All right? Now that's relevant from the cardiac standpoint because if you keep waking up at night, you're not getting into that rest restorative mode for a prolonged period of time. You're going to have these interruptions that can potentially end up impacting the quality of your sleep. It can end up impacting down regulation of those inflammatory molecules that I was talking about. All right. Now. This is just to bring home the point of how sleep can be associated with heart disease and the number of hours you sleep. The average individual will like to sit there and say, particularly when you're young and even people who go into their 30s and 40s because of work requirements and family requirements, I don't need a lot of sleep. I can get by on four to five hours. Well, this graph is showing you habitual sleep duration here it's 2.4, at the very end it's 10.4 hours of sleep a night. The axis going up tells you your risk for having or dying from a heart attack. All right, so this is pretty pointed. You're averaging somewhere between, let's say, six to eight hours of sleep. It's pretty narrow here. Your risk of having a heart attack is not too significant. All right, you're probably gonna have it for other reasons. But there's a correlation with the less sleep you get, the more likely you are to have a heart attack. This is for the type A's, like me. And then you have the individuals here, between the eight to 10 hours, where you can also see there's a significant increase for their risk of having a heart attack. So you're saying if you get a lot of sleep, you can have one, if you get less sleep, you can have one? Exactly. Oh, it's gotta be right in the middle. Well, so don't cause stress about this. <laughs> <laughs> the point behind this is don't assume that four hours of sleep because I have a thousand things I need to get done during the day is not going to kill me. If you're a short sleeper, and there are people like this, who, you know, from childhood on never needed more than four to five hours of sleep. Well, that's their norm. 
Okay, this is just for people who like to restrict themselves for social obligations, work obligations, or the men who like to think that sleeping 10 to 12 hours is perfectly normal and there's nothing wrong with it. There are women who think this way too, but I would say by and large, guys have more, less of an issue with sleeping 10 to 12 hours than women do, at least the ones who come in the office. All right, um, so just quickly, insomnia is the perception of insufficient or unrestorative sleep. So this is a very common problem. A third of the population probably has this as a significant health problem. 50% of us have gone through this at some point of time that number might actually be higher. So even though the number is 50%, I don't think the studies, and they recognize this, necessarily accurately document this. We've all gone through this during a period of loss from a loved one, exam stress, life stress, work stress. There are periods where you will not sleep as well. But typically, we come out of it. And the people who don't, that's where the problem arises. It's not short periods of time where you need to worry or stress about this. But if it's not getting better, talk to your doctor. All right, so this is just belaboring that concept. Um, <coughs> I'm not going to go into any of this if you guys have questions, because I'd like to leave time at the end for questions. I can come back to these slides if you'd like. Okay, so let's talk about um, a little bit more about sleep, um, sleep. Let's talk about sleepiness, sorry. So being sleepy all the time or falling asleep during the day. So I have a lot of people who also come in the office and say to me, napping is totally normal, especially when I get older. Well, yes, it probably is to some degree. If you haven't had enough sleep the night before, then it's not unusual between <coughs> 1 to 3 o'clock to feel sleepy because your body is dipping into a sleepy period. Um, South, Ameri so um, South America, Middle East, Europe, Southern Europe, nap or siesta time was a norm. It's less so now because of the 24-hour business cycle, but the reality is that that's a downtime for the body, so people are more likely to fall asleep in that time period. What this is basically showing you, though, is that if someone naps, and those are the white bars, so yellow, green is I don't nap, yellow is I do nap, the chance that you will then have an underlying medical problem is higher. So people who get up at night to pee, only about 10% of them who are otherwise healthy, I'm sorry, so 10% of people who have medical problems say, no, I don't get up to nap. But here, 17%, I'm doing this backward and I apologize. So I'm explaining it wrong. Um, if you don't get up to pee, 10% of those people have some kind of medical problem. If you do get up to pee, 18% of them have some kind of underlying medical problem. And the same holds true across. So what you're basically seeing is if somebody has an underlying heart problem, hypertension, lung disease, they're more likely to nap. About 40% of people who have underlying medical problems are napping. Now, it basically doesn't mean that napping means you have a medical problem, but what it implies is that if you're napping, it may be due to your underlying body health. It may be a marker that something is going on. It's not age related? No. Age has nothing to do with it. Age has nothing to do with it except the fact that you're now retired, you can go home and go do whatever you want, whenever you want. <laughs> it also means a lot of people who retire suddenly lose their sleep structure because they no longer have to go to bed at to 8 or 10 o'clock at night to get up at 4 or 6 o'clock in the morning to go to work. So they go to bed midnight, they get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to feed the cat, have some coffee, breakfast, toodle around, sit in front of the TV, and go to sleep. Wow. So that nap could very well end up being that you only got six hours of sleep, but you really need eight. Okay, so it's a, that's kind of a marker of disrupted sleep if you want to look at it that way. But a lot of people get up at night to pee because of the medications they're taking. They get up to pee because they've got untreated sleep apnea. Um, they get up because they have a lot of life stressors on their mind. How about so, they get too much water? There you go. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem too, but that's a solvable one. Too much coffee. Yeah, yeah. well, too much coffee at bedtime is a big problem. You're not sleeping properly. And I've got people who sit there and tell me, oh, I sleep like a rock. I have a cappuccino and I'm in bed 30 minutes later. I'm like, well, that's great. But if you actually look at the data, so let's talk about what's going on on a head blood level. 
your brain's waking up all over the place. Okay, you're not aware of it probably because your sense of being awake is dampened down. A coffee before bedtime is a bad idea. At least from my standpoint, not necessarily from yours. Yes, so that's also a problem. Well, forget about excessive, even like a glass or two, all right? Um, so half a glass might be okay, but really, if people are going to do it, there is health benefit, do it at dinner time. So what alcohol is going to do is it's going to suppress your awareness of things. It kind of acts like a, a downer or a depressant. But when the effect of alcohol wears off, your brain is suddenly awake. So people who take alcohol to help them fall asleep are falling asleep, but then when they wake up, they wake up with a vengeance and it's very hard for them to fall back. Typically, these are individuals who have a very active mind. All right, we're under a lot of emotional stress and the alcohol dampens that down, but once they wake up, their mind's rubbing at 60 miles an hour and then on, um, and they won't go back to sleep. And that's mostly what my insomnia patients are expressing as well. People pass out for at least eight hours. They do, but that hour isn't going to be enough. Eight hours? <laughs> You're going to have to keep taking a drink. Don't say that. What, what hour beyond which you should not take a drink to well, facilitate sleeping I, well? I would recommend at least three to four hours before bedtime. So like if you have dinner, the recommendation is three hours. Have your dinner three hours before you go to bed. Because um, I don't talk about it here, but we can talk sure. about it. Um, heartburn is actually one of the most common causes of sleep disruption. Um, and people don't even think about it because it's there during the day, it's there at night, and well, hell, I live with it. But the problem is that it's disrupting your sleep. So if you look at a brainwave level, when we do sleep studies, we're looking at the brainwave activity and looking at it to say, are you awake or asleep? In people who have sleep disruption, they're waking up often on a micro level. So they're waking up for five or ten seconds long enough so the brain is shifting to the wake mode and going into a wake state and then going straight back to sleep. Where this is relevant is because when you have these microarousals, your heart rate picks up, your blood pressure picks up, that has an impact on you from a heart standpoint. And that's where sleep apnea fits into this and that's where restless leg symptoms or periodic leg movements also fit in. It's these microarousals and the effect they're having on your physiologic system. And what causes so, the heart problem? Heartburn is caused by many reasons. Um, so that's going to be something that would be a, a totally separate conversation. Um, but it's really hard, probably in part due to diet. And so there are individuals who will never have problems and suddenly start having problems with certain kinds of food. It probably means that they've reached a certain tipping point as far as their body balance goes, and particularly their stomach. It's a reflection of acid imbalance in the body. Um, so diet. You can't eat something you Exactly. So people sit there and say, it's not because of this, because I could always eat it. That's not true. Mm -hmm. um, things shift. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a function of, of stress, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's the bottom point, and then it shifts into lots of other categories. Yeah, I uh, asked, uh, uh, complained to my doctor about peeing too much in, at night, because you, you wake up and the activity, and it's not good. Uh, as she said um, that uh, first thing, you know, don't drink much after the meals, as you suggested. And then she said that you know, older women, the uh, uh, vagina and the interior, the things dry. Mm -hmm. a little, and that they found that, that uh, an estrogen treatment of some sort, I don't know, cream or whatever, uh, helps uh, relax so that, that there's no dryness there and the tension is <coughs> released uh, to pee and you can hold, hold it longer, I guess, is the thought. I, I don't know. Alright, so what's being asked is, sure about that. are there changes in a woman's physiologic system, meaning in terms of the hormones? and how those hormones, estrogen and progesterone, have an effect on your lower personal area. Okay, sorry. Um, just guys might not want to hear this, so, um, and I have to. But the bottom, bottom line is um, there are areas, the, the lower GI tract does become more dry with hormone changes, so there might be more of a sense of awareness of the need to use the bathroom or the urge to urinate. 
But if you are not getting up a lot during the day to use the bathroom, then you really should not be getting up a lot at night to use the bathroom. And I'd use that as a marker. So if you go to the bathroom every hour or two when you're awake, then if you're getting up every hour or two when you're asleep, is probably a reflection of bladder dysfunction or relaxation of the bladder um, sphincter. So that can have an impact. But if you don't get up often during the day to go and use the bathroom, then chances are getting up at night a lot may reflect that there's an underlying problem. Often medication, like people will take hydrochlorothiazide, Lasix, they're diuretics in the evening, and never even think about the fact that this is what's making them get up to pee. So that's a very easy fix. Not drinking coffee, not having a glass of water before you go to bed, and then having a bottle of water next to the bedside to take a sip every time you wake up because your mouth is dry will help. Um, Good, thank you. Oh, okay, so, <laughs> this is why to get most people bother to come into my office. It's not because they think it's a problem, it's because the person lying next to them thinks it's a problem. And they want them back in bed. Okay, so, let's talk about um, heart disease and um, sleep. And sleep. Um, Interestingly enough, there are two groups of people. There are the group of people who are more likely to die from a cardiac event, usually between 6 and 10 in the morning. Okay? These are people who do not have an underlying problem with sleep. All right? So they have risk factors for a heart attack or heart disease, but they don't have a sleep problem. Those individuals are more likely to move on between 6 to 10 in the morning. But there are a group of people who are more likely to die between 4 and 6 o'clock in the morning or 4 and 8 o'clock in the morning. But let's say this is a group I want to focus on, the midnight to like 5 o'clock in the morning. So you can see there's a pretty big spike here. And you can see afternoon and before 10 o'clock, the probability of having a heart attack is a lot less. So the point behind this is if you have an underlying breathing disorder during sleep, or you have an underlying sleep disorder where you wake up a lot. Sleep apnea is really the most common one that people think about for this. Um, it's likely to occur because of the sleep disorder. That's when you just stop breathing, right? You just stop yes. Breathing, yes. And you wake up or you wake up. Exactly. Um, so that's, I just want to take home the point that, yes, we are all going to go at some point, but if we want to optimize our quality of life and our life expectancy, then addressing underlying sleep problems can really be helpful in your overall body health, so from a preventative medicine standpoint. Now, um, forgive me, let me just... Okay, somehow I got my slides mixed up, so I apologize. I'm going to go through this really quickly because um, there's one other point I want to bring up before I let you guys start asking me questions. Um, so just to talk about what sleep apnea is. This is, if I were to just take a saw and go down this way and open, this would be my nose, this is my mouth, this is the back of my airway. Obstructive sleep apnea is basically narrowing of the airway anywhere between here and before your vocal cords start. This is all smooth muscle. Right now, every one of you is awake. You're breathing, no problems. And every one of you, when you fall asleep or drift off, this airway narrows. The smooth muscle becomes floppy. That's also normal. What's not normal is that it gets too floppy and the airflow can't go through. So apnea is where it completely closes. Hypopnea or respiratory events that wake you up are where it narrows to the point where it's hard for the airflow to go through. All right, either way, usually your brain is shifting to the wake mode. Long enough so that the heart rate revs up, blood pressure transiently surges, and then you go back to sleep because that arousal opens up the airway so you can breathe, now you're back to sleep. You have no conscious awareness of what happened, but it revved up everything. All right, so addressing underlying sleep disorders is extremely helpful from a preventative health standpoint and from improving your overall quality of life. All right, so 
Um, Dr. Nath is going to talk about peripheral vascular disease. So just to open that up, you know, everybody thinks about the heart. <coughs> Um, and as Dr. Nath, I'm sure, will discuss with you, your blood vessels are an organ, all right? What affects your heart is affecting your blood vessels. So it's all interrelated. And anything that affects the inflammatory process is going to affect both of those organs. So this I've kind of talked about. I'm not going to belabor. This is just a good picture to look at. This shows you, I'm going to just show it down here because this is all I can reach. This is your sympathetic tone. Your blood vessels have sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves in them. When you are startled, when you feel like you're under attack, your sympathetic system revs up. Those blood vessels clamp down. All right? In a normal person who is awake and not stressed, this is the tone of that blood vessel. It's normal. Just suffice it to say it's normal. What I want you to notice is a patient who has obstructive sleep apnea, when they're awake, you can see that that blood vessel tone is way revved up. So they're awake, they're not even asleep and having these micro arousals revving up their blood pressure, but their blood pressure remains elevated even in wake period because their apnea is not treated. So this is long term and this is an extreme example. Again, this is not everybody, but this is just to illustrate a point. Um, so this is the last thing I want to talk about for a few minutes. Restless leg syndrome and periodic limb movement. There's an increasing awareness about this disorder. And there's data from the late 70s and 80s and early 90s, which is now being acknowledged more um, openly than it was before. What they're recognizing is that both with restless leg symptoms and periodic leg movements, there's a higher incidence of hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. So a phenomenon that nobody really knew what to do with 15, 20 years ago now has a lot of treatment options out, and there's recognition that treating this can be extremely helpful, again, from a preventative health standpoint, and reducing your risk for progression of hypertension, and um, in terms of having a heart event, and possibly stroke as well. What exactly is Yes. So, yeah, so restless leg syndrome. What is it? That's, I'm, I'm going to right now. So, Basically, the definition is, is it's leg pain or leg discomfort that occurs in the evening hours, worse in the evening. Some people will have it during the day, but if it's not worse at night, then it's probably not restless leg syndrome because it's a, something that follows kind of like a body cycle over a 24-hour period. So it's leg discomfort worse in the evening, worse when you sit down to rest. So when you lie down in bed, sit in front of the TV, that's when you're going to start noticing this leg discomfort. And then rubbing the leg, massaging it, walking, moving around will make the leg pain or discomfort less. Okay? Children may describe this as growing pains. Um, it definitely increases with age. Now, restless leg syndrome, I'm going to segue it into periodic limb movement. PLM or periodic limb movements are not something that you're aware you're doing. You may not have leg discomfort. You might wake up with leg cramps at night, but you're not going to have leg discomfort in the evening. But more often than not, it's the bed partner telling the other person that your legs are twitching. And they do it with a periodic pattern. Some people will tell me every 5 seconds, every 10 seconds, 20, 30. But the partner will notice that it has a rhythmic pattern. It's more common as we get older, and typically, I don't treat this. I mean, even now, I will tell my patients, if you're not sleepy during the day, if you feel well rested, I'm not going to treat this, but I need to start thinking about changing my thought process, and the reason why is because periodic leg movements also are associated with a higher incidence of hypertension and heart disease. The problem is a lot of the medications used to treat it can cause sleepiness and have side effects, so for me, it always ends up being something where you risk you weigh the risk versus the benefit. All right, I'm going to end here rather than continue to go through slides because I find that questions um, can often help everybody in the audience. What is the HTM? Hypertension. HTM. Yep. Hy hypertension. Oh. Hypertension. Sorry, I should learn to take the acronyms out. Why is it that when you do get the required amount of sleep, you feel like you had less than that amount? All right, so that depends on the person, all right? And especially if you're asking for yourself, which I don't know if you are or not, but usually um, younger people need more sleep than what they recognize. So especially in um, adolescents, probably up to about 20, 
um, the typical sleep hours are probably not six to seven hours. If you look at adolescents, they truly need 10 to 11 hours of sleep a night. They're not getting it, but that's what they need. Um, so my first response to a young person if they ask me that question would be that you're probably not getting enough sleep hours. The other is that there might be a phase delay component. And what I mean by this is um, in adolescence, biologically, your drive to sleep is probably going to be stronger between 12 to 1 o'clock at night. That's really when you want to go to bed. And your body doesn't really want to wake up until 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. Okay? So if you're getting up at 7 o'clock, biologically there's still a strong drive to sleep in the system. Um, there's data to show that um, out in Colorado they actually shifted school times um, and started school later. And what they found was a marked improvement in school performance and decrease in truancy. The behavior was just much better when kids were allowed to follow a little bit more of their normal biologic pattern for sleep. Okay. Have you found the natural alternatives to Ambien? Ha. A lot of meditation and exercise. It takes work. All right. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing when I say it, but I'm, I'm totally serious. Meditation um, before you go to sleep? I can also be during the day. I mean, again, for what I tell my patients who come in with insomnia and I can't sleep, I close my eyes and some people tell me I sleep. I sleep the whole night and I still wake up exhausted. Now, these are not young people. These are older individuals who've led very active lives. But I talk to them. Their mind is going the whole time they're awake. I have to do this, 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 and this. They're thinking about six different things in their head while they're driving the car down the throughway. You know, their mind is constantly going. Your mind is not going to suddenly turn off when you go to bed. All right? It's... It's a switch, but it's not that kind of switch. Is that the same thing when you can't fall asleep? Sometimes I'll stay up all night going, I go to sleep. And I finally fall asleep at 6 o'clock in the morning. Yes. It's usually because of mind activity, anxiety, stress. And so that's a totally different angle. So when I say that about the Ambien, Ambien can, what Ambien does is it binds to a receptor which promotes sleep, which is called GABA. All right? But GABA can be overridden by mind activity. Just like caffeine can, to some extent, override it as well. So Ambien can help in some people and other people because the extent of anxiety or mind activity is such, they actually need additional medication to help dampen their mind activity down so that they can sleep. Um, but, I guess that there's a natural alternative. Yeah, I'm not aware of anything per se. There are GABA, so S, people take serotonin or serotonin supplements, and some of them have success, but they, others don't. Ambien sometimes is much more targeted in how it binds. Um, SAMe is a precursor to serotonin, but if I have patients take it, I take it in, have them take it in the morning. Um, and then tryptophan, there's a lot of press about that, and has been about turkey or milk. Um, if you're going to do that option, again, recognize if your mind's active, it may not be enough. If you're going to take something like tryptophan, like turkey or milk or peanut butter before you go to bed to kind of facilitate things, take a little bit of carbohydrate with it, like a little bit of cracked or toast, because that facilitates absorption. Um, and then um, there are preparations for 5-GABA. I mean, there are, if you go to the health food store, some of them actually sell GABA in and of itself. I've got some patients who take theanine and find that to be very helpful. Now, that's not gap binding to GABA, but it's a, it also facilitates in sleep, but a lot of people find that they wake up sleepy with that. Um, so it really depends on the person in terms of what works for them. What about melatonin? Melatonin, oh, this is the last question. I'm oh, sorry, because I'm, I'm getting the little signal. Uh, um, yes. So melatonin, again, coming back to the whole concept of um, wake versus sleep. Melatonin is a transmitter or a hormone produced by the body telling the body to do dark cycle activities. In a bat, it's to wake up and get bugs. In a human, it's to go to sleep. It, it's produced in very small levels in the body. But people tend to take 3 milligrams, 6 milligrams, 9 milligrams. The more, the better, I'll sleep better. That's not true. And if you're taking melatonin and you look at the research, data to take melatonin is supported in people who are have circadian rhythm disorders, meaning biologically their drive to sleep is later, whether it's as an adolescent, or um, older individuals tend to have a shift in their cycle and want to go to bed at 8, 7 or 8 o'clock. Their stronger drive to sleep is earlier, not later. Um, so melatonin can help with that. Melatonin can help if you're jet lagged. 
Um, so if you're traveling across time zones, melatonin can help. And in people who have blindness, uh, because one of the ways that melatonin is regulated is by light. So in someone who's blind and cannot see, they're not able to regulate a sleep-wake cycle because the light isn't there to reset their body clock for melatonin production. So those are the three situations where it's found helpful. Yeah, one more fast one. Thank you. Uh, what's the difference between holding the breath and stop breathing? I think I hold my breath. Holding your breath is voluntary. But I do it at night when I sleep. That's voluntary. And what, what I would ask you to do is um, just look at how you're breathing when you're awake. All right. Most people will recognize that they're shallow breathing or they are holding their breath even when they're awake. And I'll talk to patients about that. Because if that's what they're doing, it's usually linked that way. Um, and so addressing that's different than addressing sleep apnea. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar.